Okay, good afternoon and welcome everybody to another virtual lunch and learn with Jane Ear. I'm Richard Rastusha, Vice President of Water Management Solutions with Jane. And uh, I'm really excited, and I'm usually all a bit extra excited about our presentation today uh, for a couple reasons. One, you know, technology is really making a difference in our lives in both uh, agriculture and landscape. And I really see uh, uh, technology helping in this battle of, uh, I think, potential worldwide uh, water issues that we're having. So that's number one. And, and talking about uh, the technologies and how we can blend them is uh, really fascinating to me. And the other is, uh, you know, our presenter, Eric Olson today. Uh, Eric's uh, the president of Jane Irrigation, has been for the last 14 years. And, uh, you know, I met Eric about eight years ago. We were Irrigation Association Board of Directors. Eric was president at the time. And I got to spend some extra time with Eric, learning about him and talking to him about water management. And I was really impressed with his vision for technology. And, you know, there's people that I meet that have a curiosity and want to talk about it. But uh, Eric has a real passion for this. And that's what I found so exciting uh, about him and what he wants uh, the direction of the company to go and, uh, and, and what he's doing and how he's helping people uh, manage water. So that's why I got very interested in the company and, and uh, ended up in Jane, you know, five years ago. Uh, what you don't know about Eric also maybe is that he's on the Water Advisory Committee for Fresno State University. He uh, is an industry advisor with Imagine H2O. Uh, he was the uh, IA board president uh, for a few years. And then he was one of the founding committee members for the Blue Tech Valley uh, group in Fresno, California. So we're really fortunate to have him uh, today talking about technology. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Eric. Eric, uh, good afternoon. Hi, Richard. Hi, everyone. Um, I was able to see who signed up uh, for the presentation. We got quite an audience, and there's a lot of uh, uh, fr friends of the industry and friends of myself there. So I, I was telling Richard early on before we started the, these uh, presentations, we used to see the, the pictures. So I know I have a lot of friends out there. And I know you're, you're here, but I can't see your faces. So uh, I hope you're doing well and uh, you're, you're safe and you're healthy. And thanks for joining us today on this uh, 30th uh, Lunch and Learn. So Richard's done a phenomenal job of organizing these for the company. So uh, Richard uh, gave me the opportunity to uh, talk about uh, this transformational irrigation technologies that we have in our industry uh, in 2020. And, and the, the idea for the presentation is that for Jane Irrigation, we supply irrigation equipment and gear in all these different market segments from agriculture, turf, landscape, golf, mining, nursery, and greenhouse. And we participate in many different crop segments and geographies and farm sizes throughout the world. And uh, this, when, when you are irrigating different crops in these market segments or geographies, we come across amazing technologies and what people are doing uh, to grow grow food and uh, make uh, landscapes and and uh, so today you know I wanted to talk about some of those uh, areas and technologies that that you might not be aware about and some and how these technologies could be used in other uh, facets of, of the the marketplace and you know today we're able to uh, see a significant value in these technologies and uh, so I, I have five or six highlighted technologies and we're gonna review those in this uh, next 30 or 40 minutes. Yes, yeah, so uh, but before we skip forward, Eric, can you give us a few examples of, of these, please? Um, well, you know I love golf, right? So, okay. you know, when I'm on the, the golf course I'm, I, and I love irrigation, I, I'm thinking about obviously my golf game, which isn't so great, but I'm uh, thinking about ir irrigation. How do they irrigate this golf, uh, you know, these acres, these 80 acres that are, are there? How do they get the water so uniformly applied? And they're pretty sophisticated uh, uh, golf uh, sprinklers and controllers. So, uh, but, you know, I learned through the irrigation uh, business that, that we have miles of wire running through the golf course along with the pipes. And I thought, wow, we used to have wires running everywhere, but now we're getting wireless control, wireless valves. So can we have wireless sprinklers through golf courses and get uh, you know get a smart sprinkler in in the golf uh, industry and I believe that can come uh, I also would think about you know satellite imagery and remote sensing 
that that could be utilized in golf courses rather than have superintendents drive the course looking for dry spots. Uh, you know, I see a massive opportunity in agriculture to use autonomous irrigation, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, we are having autonomous irrigation today on the turf landscape side of our business through our ET water uh, smart controller that is very sophisticated. It's taking the weather forecasts and looking, you know, kind of what's what the outlook looks like, what the heat index and wind is going to be, takes all those variables and gives you a schedule that's automatically uh, sets up to uh, for your turf or landscape. And we're, we're running that on more than 12,000 commercial landscape sites that are pretty large, pretty sophisticated uh, operations. And we can bring this to ag and have this autonomous irrigation coming to ag. So there's, you know, a lot of, a lot of potential here and hopefully this presentation will give you some uh, insight and, and, and spark some creativity on what technologies could be applied in other industries. Before we get into, you know, the real details of the specifics of um, some of these uh, technology solutions, I want to uh, lay out for you and give a vision of the Jane technology footprint as it exists today. Uh, we've had through Richard's previous uh, lunch and learns, we learned a lot about ET and we've had lessons on distribution, uniformity and evapotranspiration. And on the right, you can see the, the tree and the vegetation there. Uh, uh, transpiring water. On the left side of the, the uh, picture there shows, you know, all the Jane technology that we uh, bring in, in, in that, that we're bringing together. And, and I'll start from, you know, the ET water uh, portion where we're looking at weather forecasts. And we use weather forecasts to actually create the irrigation schedule for turf landscape companies. And, and those details can go into an irrigation controller like, like our smart uh, controllers. Uh, also, we have a partnership with AgriLogix and that provides satellite imagery and also um, calculations on say ET, ETC uh, and then also distribution uniformity. Th those inputs can be fed into our controllers. Now we have a whole host of irrigation controllers uh, from ET water, uh, our turf landscape ET water controllers, our Jane Logic, our agriculture controllers, and Gavish uh, is the, the controller that we have for nursery greenhouse. So, uh, but what's unique about the Jane system is we take in the ET water uh, weather forecast data, the satellite imagery data, put, bring these into our irrigation controller along with soil moisture data and sensing. And you've seen a couple presentations in the webinar on soil moisture. And we're really the only company now that's bringing in all these facets of, uh, of the irrigation to come up with a really an optimized irrigation schedule. And we're using these sophisticated uh, artificial intelligence tools, not only the machine learning that we're using on soil moisture, but also the, there's artificial intelligence tools we're using in the ET water uh, controller. So, we're uh, pretty excited about what we're going to be bringing, what we're bringing today, and the future looks very good in terms of the overall company and strategy and technologies that we'll be deploying to help growers uh, save uh, water. Yeah, so it's interesting, Eric, because uh, you're really in a unique position, uh, you know, Jane and yourself heading up the acquisitions of PureSense, Observant, ET Water. Uh, you've really gotten to look at a lot of opportunities uh, while you were out uh, looking at acquisitions. Uh, and, then, uh, and then you've been able to bring them all to Jane or the ones you have uh, uh, you brought to Jane. Um, how, how have you been able to bring all these technologies together? Yeah, that's been uh, really the, the joy of my career. And I give, I give all the credit for uh, linking these companies and making a one integrated solution to to uh, our technical company uh, team members. Uh, we're fortunate enough to acquire uh, four tremendous ag startups and we've partnered with a few others over the last five to seven years. And you know, in these companies and these acquisitions, there's some of the most talented and, and mission-driven uh, associates that you know, I've ever worked with. And, and they all have this vision of creating a, a leading irrigation technical company and they've been unselfish in, uh, you, you know, uh, focusing on an integrated product that moves, moves us to leadership and moving forward. So I'm really uh, grateful and thankful for all those 
uh, employees that have worked in an integrated fashion. We've had an amazing parent company, which you know about out of India. They've supported us along the way 100%. And, you know, this tenured team of technical uh, people and, you know, all the, the marketing people in our company, you know, they've done a tremendous job. And I know they're really proud of the, the billions of gallons of water they've been able to help our customers save. So really a, a, a phenomenal story. Well, uh, that's kind of the, the overview slide here uh, of the Jane irrigation kind of uh, equipment and, and, and offering. So let's uh, get into some specifics of, about uh, this, uh, these uh, technologies. Uh, the first one I want to review is autonomous irrigation. And, you know, autonomous means a device capable of op operating without human control. And you know, I, I've been trying to bring autonomous irrigation to agriculture with, with all my uh, work and efforts for, for some time now. And there are some drawbacks and, and some, you know, challenges in getting that implemented. And a lot of times I, you know, use the example in our turf landscape business and say, look, uh, we are growing and maintaining sophisticated landscape irrigation systems. Uh, with our ET water uh, controllers. And these have, these are big valve banks, 48 banks. They got water restrictions on when you can water and when you can't. They have yeah. fertilizer options. And that is autonomous irrigation. And it is here and we are doing it and it is happening. And it's not happening on one R&D farm. This is happening all across the U.S. with big customers like Wells Fargo and TD Bank and Target and, and Caltrans. And we're helping these guys save a lot of water. And you've seen earlier presentations on that. So they're, they're seeing water savings and plant material. And I really want to get this, help people get this in to open field uh, agriculture, this autonomous irrigation, bringing uh, forth the tools of that previous slide, bringing it together. And, and I think we're ready. And I'm, you know, hopefully this presentation gives some people uh, some confidence that we can move forward with that. Yeah, so I always, I spent a lot of time thinking about this, right? Uh, from the ET water side. And I think about, um, you know, there's not a whole lot city in America has landscapes valued at over a million dollars that they're spending a million dollars in maintenance on annually, and they're spending close to a million dollars in water. And we're talking about irrigating things like trees, shrubs, annual color, and uh, turf all on the same controller. So it is complex and it is valuable, and we're using autonomous irrigation there, and it's working, right? People wouldn't be using it if it didn't work, and it wasn't giving them some savings. So um, why, aren't we, why aren't we seeing this more in ag? You know, expense has been uh, one reason, and but I think confidence has been an, another reason. Uh, the the constraints, you know, that that we've seemed to have, you know, there maybe there hasn't been uh, solutions in the past, or at least you know people have perceived that there's not solutions. For example, if someone's getting surface water in California and they only get water on Tuesdays and Saturdays, they you know, oftentimes think, well, how can I do autonomous irrigation when I get surface water when the district gives it? Well, you know, the, the autonomous irrigation controllers of ET water deal with those restrictions automatically. You, you can't water on certain days because, you know, they, they say you can only water on these days and that programming is all done for you. So these are, are really, um, you know, not very large obstacles to overcome. I would say also, Richard, we've had some failed startups that have burned some growers and, you know, the yeah. growers would buy a lot of equipment, make a huge investment, and then the startup might not make it. And so the growers are, uh, you know, maybe gun shy in this. But I just want to say, look, we're ready. We got a lot of experience on autonomous irrigation and solutions on commercial landscape, nursery greenhouse, very sophisticated, controlling irrigation and the environment. And we have some excellent automation solutions for a, a range of investment risk and return. And, and let's get started on it. I mean, there's, there's ways to grow better crops, labor's an issue, and, and we are, we're definitely uh, uh, ready. Um, so how do we feel confident about this uh, autonomous irrigation? One, one area you can look at is in, indoor growing. And uh, indoor growing or controlled environmental agriculture is you know, anything in a, in a greenhouse, glasshouse, indoor or vertical. And, and maybe um, 
We've heard about what's happening in, in the Netherlands and the story there for greenhouse growing is, is absolutely fascinating. Uh, ne the Netherlands is the second largest vegetable exporter in the world. And 80% of their cultivated land, agriculture land, is under glass. Now, you can see a picture there in the lower left. That's, that's a pretty big house there. Those yields could typically be 10x to 20x compared to open field ag uh, that we might see, say, for tomatoes in, in the U.S. So a huge difference on yield. And they're using maybe 8x less water, limited pesticides. And, you know, in terms of, you know, water and fertilizer, maybe they use only 25% of the fertilizer that you might use in open ag. So uh, the Netherlands is a, just a, an amazing story. And they're using uh, the picture there, you can see they're growing in a substrate. And the substrate, you know, a lot of it could be coconut husk or mineral uh, wool. A lot of times they'll put uh, these LED lights and put in CO2 to help uh, the crops grow faster. The Netherlands also does a lot of rainwater harvesting. Uh, so it's a, it's a tremendous story. They're obviously uh, profitable in what they do. So this, this can work. Um, you know, globally, uh, we're seeing um, some big expansions in this controlled environmental ag as well. And there, there's a lot of controlled environmental ag in, in China. They lead the way. Uh, Spain, South Korea, Italy, and Turkey are, are big uh, countries that focus on this. Mexico is a really a large growing market for, for the controlled environmental ag. The U.S., we're a relatively small player with only 2,200 acres uh, of this uh, glass greenhouse. Uh, so relatively small for that 1.3 million. So a lot of the technology and how to, how to grow and how to uh, get these yields and water savings is, is happening. The technology is happening in the Netherlands and that's being, you know, done in these other areas. Um, so but you can kind of see that there's a lot of automation. You can get some mechanical harvesting. Obviously the irrigation, it's all autonomous here. All it's autonomous and you got that high uh, water use and efficiency and pretty good pro productivity. That picture on the right um, this is from the Nebraska Innovation uh, Center in the University of Nebraska Lincoln, and it's at the, the Greenhouse Technology Center there. And what you're looking at is a sugar uh, cane plant, and it's on a, a tray that's moving along that has a little waste scale in it. And this uh, um, is for R&D purposes, and they're putting, you know, different amounts of lights or nutrients and water into this plant, and they're measuring all the vitals of it every day to see how these sugarcane uh, samples uh, can, can grow. This is obviously R&D, but you can see how you could get down to the plant level for uh, irrigating and fertigating and, you know, giving the plant the individual light that it needs. Um, so this is pretty, pretty fast. This is happening in Nebraska. If you're ever on the campus there in Lincoln, I encourage you to uh, go visit that, that facility. It's awesome. Yeah, so the first thing I thought about when I saw this, Eric, is I thought uh, right away about the labor, labor savings, right? Um, that, that's going to be huge. I think about the water savings, too. But it all looks uh, uh, fascinating, but it looks really expensive to me, too. What, what about that side of it? Yeah, the, the, the greenhouse glass house business is uh, that production environment is, is an economically viable business. They're doing well, but the, you know, maybe the, you know, the indoor growing where we have the vertical farms where you're stacking those layers, that still may not be profitable today. And there may be more innovation required to bring down the energy costs of these vertical farms. Uh, people are making progress. We have a, a company in uh, San south of San Francisco called Plenty. They're doing a lot of research and bringing the, you know, the costs uh, down. But the capital costs are high. The energy costs are very high. Uh, the footprint, uh, you get a lot for the footprint. So I think we're going to see a lot of development here. When you think about the produce that's grown in California, the average 
uh, freight distance that's on the produce is something like, you know, I think it's over 2,000 miles that in days that we're putting on that produce. And if these vertical farms can be put in, in uh, uh, urban areas that you can take a lot of that uh, supply chain cost and, and wastage out of the system. So uh, pretty, pretty excited. It is expensive. So uh, we'll see what happens on the, uh, on the uh, vertical farm side. Now, uh, the, kind of the presentation was the talk about transferable technologies. And uh, one of the innovations that was made by our company, uh, Nandan Jain in Israel, was to take those indoor greenhouse cooling and misting systems and bring that to the outdoors. And they uh, developed this uh, fogging product uh, for cooling applications. And Richard, you hosted a webinar earlier uh, this, this, uh, this session where we had uh, these cooling cooling on apples. And this is a pretty amazing job here. Again, it's bringing this uh, uh, technology to the outdoors. We have uh, the, this uh, cooling here that takes a lot less water. We can get uh, anywhere from eight to 10 degrees uh, drop in temperature for those kind of those climate change uh, times in the season when it gets very hot. Now the applications for these are, are apples, cherries, pears, and we're in the Central Valley of California and we're growing uh, a lot of the wine grapes that get bottled in the Napa Valley wine, but it, it's gonna be hot here. It's gonna be 107 degrees in the next few days. And, and if you had cooling like this, this, and we could reduce the temperature, those grapes would actually do uh, a little better there. And you know, to bring this all together though, there, you might have this cooling application that only happens five to seven times a year when it gets really hot, you need to reduce that temperature. So uh, bringing in those controllers from that greenhouse application to this outdoor where you can handle the irrigation, fertigation, cooling the environment that can handle all that that that's also here and we're ready for that so this is pretty exciting uh, technology what we can do and now the crops of where we can grow i'm just thinking eric i'm looking at these foggers and i'm, I'm you know what a great product that is i know how well they work and and the results and then i'm thinking well gee what would what did they do before they had foggers what would these guys do yeah the the uh as my kids would say, the, the old school way of this was to use these big uh, kind of metal impact uh, sprinklers and just throwing a lot of water out and it's the water's getting everywhere and it's, it takes a lot more pressure to operate those sprinklers and you're throwing a lot of extra water. Uh, this new method of, of outdoor cooling allows you to, you know, drop the temperature up to 10 degrees and you're going to use 30 to 50% less water. Uh, huge savings, and you're going to use 15 to 20% less pressure. And that's a lot of money to the grower when you're talking a few dollars per PSI per acre per season. Those operating costs really add up, and you're going to get this uh, cooling level. And then you don't have the water all over, so the environmental issues either. So uh, pretty exciting there. So can um, they actually buy smaller pumps as a result of that lower PSI? They, they could, but uh, typically these are dual systems. So you, you, you know, it just depends on the, the other uh, part of the system. Um, one of the technologies that I'd like to show next, again, it's a, it's a combination of uh, these different industries. It's taking a drip irrigation to the pivot. And most of you have, have seen this presented and it's been around for a while. It's called mobile drip irrigation. And this was invented by a gentleman by the name of Claude Finet about 40 years ago. And um, it's been around for a while. People have tried uh, to, uh, you know, different versions of this from pulling drip tape to pressure compensating drippers, non-pressure compensating drippers. And there's, there's always seems to be some uh, challenges uh, with it taking a hold, but the idea, uh, it's, a, it's a phenomenal idea and it's been really perfected by the IA uh, inventor of the year last year. His name is Monty Teeter and his uh, emails on there. And Monty spent uh, the last, you know, seven, eight years really perfecting uh, this Dragon Line system, this orange, we'll call it orange, that's his brand, orange mobile drip irrigation. And <clears throat> what, it, what it does 
is it basically takes the advantages of drip irrigation and you're dragging drip hose from the center pivot uh, and, and dripping the water through, through those uh, drip hoses. And there's pressure compensating drippers every six inches and you can put that in the, in the rows or furrows. So you're laying the water uh, right down uh, near the soil underneath the plant. And it, it's, a, it's a huge savings. And, and I saw this firsthand uh, two years ago visiting uh, Monty and uh, the savings of water can be 15 to 50%. And that's due to the significant reduction in evaporation. There's all kinds of side benefits here from soil condition improvements, improved crops, you can do germinations, but uh, Monty's really figured out how to do this and do this and retrofit all the different types of uh, pivots out there. It's done a, a tremendous uh, job. Now, people always ask, wow, it sounds great. I can save 50% 50, 50 water. Now, the picture on the right, I wanna, wanna say, pivot irrigation's come a, a long way. That pivot on the right, uh, Dragon Line may be able to save, say, 15 or 20% water compared to that pivot on the right. You can see that pivot on the right has sprinklers that are pretty low. Uh, you can see some droplet size, but you can also see a fine mist. That mist would typically get evaporated. And then when you get water on the crop, that water is also going to evaporate. So imagine a windy day coming through and it's 100 degrees and dry, you're going to lose a lot of that water. Versus the picture on the left, you can see the water is going right down to the uh, roots there. You also see the water on the wheel tracks. The wheel tracks then cause compaction in the soil uh, and cause spinning and ruts and and you're also uh, dropping the water down on the soil. So um, and this is a pretty pretty advanced pretty common uh, center pivot irrigation system today and, and the dragon line still provides some uh, significant benefits. Now People always ask, wow, it looks great. I can save all that water, all that fertilizer. What does it cost? Now, this might retail, uh, this retrofit for two to $400 an acre. And it really depends on the length of the pivot that you're buying. Uh, the payback can be one to four years for a retrofit system, depending on uh, you know, the, the water uh, levels, the savings the, and the crop value and pricing that you have. Uh, just for uh, people, if they don't know uh, what the cost of a pivot is, a center pivot new might cost you seven to eight hundred dollars an acre. So this uh, retrofit system, you know, is two to four hundred hundred dollars an acre, and you have to maybe buy some uh, fil filtration. But it's an amazing option to save water, fertilizer, and energy in any places where it's hot, dry, and windy. It might be the only option to stay viable. Uh, think of all the pivots sold in the Middle East, like Saudi Arabia, or um, wherever you have water wells dropping dramatically. You know, to run a large center pivot, you might need a thousand gallons per minute uh, to run a center pivot. In some places on the edge of the Ogallala Aquifer, uh, water wells in the wells have dropped, and maybe the well only produces 250 gallons a minute, and now you can. Uh, uh, you know, grow a good crop on, you know, say 300 gallons a minute, where without that, this, this pivot and the sprinklers wouldn't run. So um, it's an amazing market opportunity as well. There's over 300,000 center pivots that have been sold in the U.S. over the last 50 years, a few, another few hundred thousand around the world. Uh, we worked with Monty to develop a dripper specifically for his dragon line. It gives a higher output and it's got more plug resistance, got the lowest CV in the industry. And we also uh, have the or orange branding on it for him as well. So very exciting uh, technology. I believe this, this is the wave of the future. Um, a quick story about when I went to uh, see Monty in uh, Ulysses, Kansas, I uh, drove out to uh, Ulysses, Kansas, and I'm driving through. It's really a center pivot country, and and I went to see Monty, and I saw uh, his farm, and it was it looked like the picture on the left, and I was totally blown away uh, that what I seen with the pivots around. It was 100 degrees. There was no humidity. You know, it seemed like a 25 to 30 mile an hour wind that day, and I saw pivots with sprinklers on the top of the pivot. And they, they were throwing the water in the air and it was all misting. It literally looked like 100% of the water that was going out was evaporating. And, I, you know, I coined the term 
mobile water evaporator and it's exactly what it looked like and I said wow this is a really good invention that Monty has here and I'm, I'm glad I went to Ulysses Kansas to see it personally because that picture stuck with me forever and you can see it a little bit on the picture on the right that that water gets evaporated and, and no one wants to waste this water you're not going to want to spend the energy and the pumping cost to throw the water and money in the air right no one wants to do that yeah, I, I remember seeing this picture, um, this photo, Eric, and I thought, well, that's generous, right? Because those sprinklers are really low to the ground compared to a lot that I see that, you know, are taller than I am. And um, so um, I, I appreciated that. But um, I also think about the, you know, dragging the, the emitter lines. What are the drawbacks here? You know, it you're dealing with a drip system, right? This is drip irrigation being pulled behind the, the pivot. So in drip, you have smaller orifices compared to sprinklers. So you're gonna need a, a proper filtration depending on the water source. If you have a, you know, a, a well, uh, well source, you, know, you can get by with some, some screen filters. If you have a surface water, you may need sand medias. If you have silts, you might need some sort of cy cyclonic uh, action. Uh, but you're going to need filtration and you're going to, you're, there's going to be a little more maintenance and monitoring. Uh, you know, this should be less than maybe a traditional SDI system. You're going to have maybe some coyote strikes biting it. You might have some leaks to repair. Uh, but it's, it's, it'd be a little more than a center pivot standard sprinkler. If you, at the end of the season, roll up the tubing and get it off the ground, you're going to have a, a lot less maintenance. And I think you're going to be pretty happy with the overall results. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I can live with all that for what, what, what I get out of that, you know, the, the benefit. So continuing with the, the center pivot uh, the theme, uh, you know, 10, 10 years ago, Mike DeFrank, one of the most uh, prolific inventors in the irrigation industry, invented a, a product that we named the Jane Genesis Sprinkler. Many of you may have seen this, but it's a, it's a radio uh, controlled variable rate sprinkler. And uh, again, you know, following this wireless example, we can uh, wirelessly communicate to each sprinkler independently and give it a specific uh, prescription to run uh, either a lot of water a little water we can change the radius and the, the diameter and the droplet size all in a little control so I want to show you this quick video and you'll uh, let's see if we can get this to work so you can watch the rotation of that sprinkler there it's pretty slow and you can also see it's less water. This is a little faster rotating. When you have faster rotating, the radius goes in closer, right? And so as you go and then further left, it's, you know, we're doubling the rotation speed there on each one. And that also impacts the droplet size. Now, as we stay further left, you can see a lot of that's evaporating, right? And kind of going away. So this would allow you to control the, the droplet size, the throw distance, and we're wirelessly communicating directions to each of these sprinklers uh, individually. Uh, we've been in trial with these sprinklers for five years. Uh, the te technology is uh, you know, really awesome. Each sprinkler can go uh, zero to 20 gallons per minute per sprinkler. Uh, the, the RPMs go from 10 to 250 RPMs and the radius from 10 to 25 feet. So really you have an inf infinite possibility uh, on these uh, uh, sprinklers and capability, and this this is the this is the right way to do VRI variable rate irrigation on the center pivot. Yes. So if I was a grower using this technology, Eric, what were some what would be some of the applications I would use it for? How, how would you use it? Well, um, you know, in in, in the, we have a cornfield here, and in let's say uh, this is irrigated corn, and maybe he the grower has an average yield for the whole farm of of two hundred bushels an acre average. Now it's going to have some standard deviation distribution on that. The standard deviation might be, let's say 10 bushels. So we might have yield in this field from 170 bushels to 230 bushels. And th that field is going to perform differently. Uh, when I can get a yield map from that, and I'm able then to see and how to address those low yielding areas and then understand is that a water fertilizer or soil type is there some other effect causing those lower yields on the lower end 
And then I can also look at the high yielding areas and try to make the rest of my fields like that as well through irrigation or fertigation. And that's the benefit then. We can send individual prescriptions as that pivot's moving around, we can give it direction on the amount of water and fertilizer as it moves around. So very, very powerful. We're able to, we should be able to uh, increase the yield and reduce the variation for the grower. There, there are some side benefits as well. There's no kind of manual adjustments uh, for nozzles. It's all automatic. You don't have to go change nozzles in the season. So a lot of, uh, you, you know, uh, other uh, benefits too on this uh, Genes Jane Genesis uh, technology. Yeah, I love the safe factor there too of not having to be climbing up and down and, and making those uh, changes. Yeah, so one technology that would be related or uh, inter interlinked with the, you know, using that Jane Genesis would be remote sensing. If I can, uh, in remote sensing is using a satellite drone or an airplane to fly your field to, you know, to do scouting or to see how it looks or create a, a prescription. And so we've been studying remote sensing for uh, the last four to five years. And, you know, we've always, there's always this question, what's better? Uh, a satellite, a drone, or an airplane, and, and this was always confusing to me for for a while. And and you know our company with with our good uh, you know technologists, we feel pretty good about uh, you know what what's what's a great way to go about this. And uh, for remote sensing, you have these different cameras that can see things that the human eye can't see, and this is absolutely fascinating. And and you can't probably understand it until you see it with your own eyes. And, and below are two pictures that helped me believe that there are cameras that can see things that we can. These cameras, you know, are spectral, thermal, to name a few, and then visible. Visible is what we can see, the different colors of the plant and the, and the reflections. Now, the uses for these uh, different cameras on these remote sensing applications, drones, satellite, or airplanes are uh, ETC, that's the evapotranspiration of the crop. The NDVI is normal dif differentiated vegetative index. That's kind of a, the, the vigor of the field. You can look at uh, that to also help you with nutrients. You can do pest scouting. You can get uniformity of the irrigation field. Uh, believe it or not, uh, it looks like we're going to get soil moisture from the satellite. And then also uh, yield estimates. So this all seems... A little bit unbelievable, right? I didn't believe that this was possible, but these pictures below helped me believe that. And the picture on the lower left uh, came from our research three years ago. It's a field in Southern California. It's an almond field. And this is the uh, distribution of ETC, the, the crop of apotranspiration uh, for an almond field. And blue, in this case, means about point. 3 0 inches per day and the white means about 0.15 and the red means zero and when i was looking at this field that red line uh, is actually a road going through a field a road and that's not transpiring so that that was that was an easy one but that white diagonal line going through the middle that was actually a power line going through the field and the trees in that line were about, uh, were replanted and they were only a few years old. And so they were transpiring about half as the rest of the field. The other white spots, they had, you know, some uh, tree pressure as well. So when I saw this picture, I went to the field and I ground truth that I was like, wow, this is, we're really onto something here. And so that, that is uh, from AgroLogix, that's an ETC uh, uniformity map. Uh, but, you know, being the good scientist that, that we are, we're still not totally convinced, right? You can fool me once, but don't fool me twice. Uh, but the next picture on the right uh, really blew me away. This is the ET of an elf alpha field in California for the growing season. The red is our Jane Logic weather station ET in the field. And the green is the satellite AgroLogix ET from the satellite, the ET measurements. And you can say, wow, one, they don't really match. There's differences there. And why the peaks in the valleys on the AgroLogix? 
And this was actually a blind study that, that was done and we didn't know the crop at the time. And we said, well, what was causing this? And it turns out it was an alfalfa field and those valleys were, you know, right after they had done the cuttings and, you know, a cut alfalfa field is going to have less ETC than a fully mature alfalfa crop, right? And when we saw this and you could see all those cuttings, we were like, wow, we're, we're sold. Uh, so those two things, remote sensing is a huge part of our technology offering today. It's going to be a bigger part tomorrow. Uh, we're integrating this remote sensing technologies into JaneLogic and with our other tools and to help us do autonomous irrigation. Yeah, I love that one slide too, the AgriLogics versus the Jane Logic, and uh, uh, I love the explanation on uh, I know from the past webinars uh, what a great product uh, our AgriLogics is, the HyperView and the HyperGrow, uh, but I'm wondering what's next in this area for Jane? What, what's your vision here? What's, what's, what's going to change? How's it going to get better? Well, you know I love golf. So, you know, I'm thinking on the golf course, hey, there's dry spots and there's wet spots. Can we use this on golf? And uh, our team's been working on our uh, uh, AgriLogics uh, golf uh, product, and we're in trial uh, on that now, and that's going to be out shortly. And we're also thinking, you know, some of these commercial landscapes that have, you know, big turf areas, we're going to, you know, be able to apply that there too, to give, give another uh, ET calculation, and then also look at the uniformity of that. So we're pretty excited about the golf and then uh, landscape uh, uh, product that we have coming. Well, one of my favorite uh, projects uh, that, that we've been working on is our soil moisture uh, predictor uh, tool. And uh, I want to uh, give Mike Schmier some props uh, for creating our soil moisture predictor or simulator. Uh, Mike Schmier is our principal software architect for Jane Logic. Uh, he led a team on this project working through the best and the proper way to utilize our 15 years of soil moisture data to predict how water moves through the soil in these permanent crop applications in California. Uh, we had a really good year of, of work and we were using this uh, Microsoft Azure Machine Learning Studio and the team came up with a great model for soil moisture prediction. Uh, we've been testing this for over a year. This is a, a screenshot that I had used in presentations. You can see it's from over a year ago. Uh, this is for almonds and jets, and you can kind of look at that schedule. And what, what is on here, and the, the top line is e, ET forecast. The solid lines are actual. Uh, the next uh, row is irrigation hours. And then soil moisture is on the bottom. And on the right side where those dashed lines, those are the model predictions. Hmm. So what you can do is uh, say, I know I need, based on uh, my AgriLogic's ETC report, I can see that I need to put on 24 hours of irrigation, but how do I put those on? Should I just irrigate all on Sunday because the power's free? or should I irrigate Monday, Wednesday, Friday when it's best for the plant and the soil, right? The, the soil water bank. And what this tool allows you to do is it, it, we have a soil moisture probe in this location and we're monitoring and tracking this. And we can plug in a schedule to say, if I run uh, eight hours on the 13th, eight hours on the 15th and eight hours on the 17th, what happens to my soil moisture wetting front. How deep does that water go down into the soil? And this is really critical for not uh, wasting water or fertilizer. And so we're really uh, pretty excited uh, about uh, what we're going to be able to do with this and how we're going to utilize this in permanent crops for our autonomous irrigation uh, product. Yeah, so that's a lot to Right, and it's really amazing. Um, and um, I'm still trying to wrap my head around why this is so important for people. Yeah, you know, look, we're pulling this all together. We have this uh, satellite imagery. We feel that using the satellite imagery ETC, along with its uniformity, uh, and with our weather forecasting that we have from uh, utilizing those tools from ET Water, our, in our new Jane Unity engine, 
uh, that ETC from AgriLogix and the Jane Unity engine, that'll tell us how much water to apply uh, mm -hmm. over a week, right? So that's the first thing. The soil moisture sensor with our machine learning model will then, if I you tell us when and how long to irrigate for each of those irrigations, it'll tell me if it's, if it's a good idea to irrigate all 24 hours in one day, spread it out over three days, two days, and it'll tell us what will happen uh, to the water. If I have an almond crop and I want the water to get to the root zone down to 36 inches, but I want the water to not go past 36 inches, uh, this tool will tell me that. Obviously, if you're gonna push water uh, past the root zone, you might be wasting it. And unfortunately, uh, nitrog nitrogen, uh, the key fertilizers carried with water in, in a lot of uh, cases. And so we'd be wasting water, energy, and fertilizer, and it, it can hurt the environment in that uh, manner as well. So that it's, it's super critical to have soil moisture, have that along with, uh, you know, and then be able to have the control. So we're pulling all these critical aspects together uh, to uh, make a, a pretty amazing autonomous irrigation system. Yeah, no, that's great. That really helps, Eric. Thank you. Well, I'm just about ready to wrap up here. Um, appreciate you guys being being with me. I, I wanted to put a plug in for uh, uh, one of my passions right now. And Richard, you know, I uh, you, you could tell from the intro, I love to volunteer and I, I just enjoy working with industry people and all these associations that I've been with uh, over the years. And uh, I wanted to make people aware of the Irrigation in Innovation Consortium. And this is a, a phenomenal group of uh, volunteers who were somehow able to get these uh, top five universities uh, together uh, along with industry partners to focus on innovative research and, and applications of, of that research. And, and uh, really a great job to Stephen uh, Smith and uh, Lakeisha Odom from FAR to help uh, figure out how to uh, fund uh, that project to shepherd us all along. And we've been a couple years in now and, and they're doing some amazing research that they're sharing with multiple universities. And so I'm really excited what uh, this group is going to be able to do in the years to come. Yeah, it's really a great group. I look at that and I see, uh, I see some of our competitors and, um, you know, really competitive with our competitors. That's, that's normal. But what I love about this industry is competitors coming together to make things better. Um, what, what else do you see about this organization that you like, you know, that, that makes it unique? Well, it, it is interesting to be able to uh, have five uh, universities work together. And I've learned a lot about what it's like to work with the universities and the constraints they have. They have a, it, it's difficult for them, uh, you know, the, the kind of the, business, the university constraints. And now you're adding multiple universities that have to work together on projects. And most of the irrigation projects, we're requiring them to the research to be done in a collaborative manner over at least two universities. So uh, that's been uh, uh, interesting and challenging. The group's two years young. And a lot of amazing research has been funded, and we got a lot of a lot of pretty good projects uh, uh, going forward. And I'm hopeful that uh, uh, well, the the team there at Colorado State, we call them the Triad. They've done a phenomenal job keeping us organized, and I'm hopeful we'll have a, a, an executive director of that group uh, uh, coming. And I see a lot of momentum. And so, if there are uh, companies that want to join or participate, it's a it's a really a a great way to stay abreast of cutting edge research across many of these crops and applications like I talked about in this presentation. Yeah, what an amazing group. So uh, Richard, yeah, I'd like to, you know, wrap up my presentation here by saying thanks. Uh, uh, thanks to the 12,000 global uh, Jane employees that are working hard each day to, to make the world a better place and for working on uh, these projects that help makes make, make uh, the lives of our irrigators uh, better and, and easier for them to save water. And you know, thanks uh, to all my uh, fellow industry partners uh, for working in this uh, great industry and, and helping out during uh, Smart Irrigation Month uh, to bring significance to water and, and water savings. And finally, Richard, uh, uh, thanks to you for uh, hosting these 
events. Uh, you've done a tremendous job with this is being your 30th uh, webinar. Uh, they're not easy to do. You still have a day job. You have to sell. Otherwise, we're not able to do this. So I appreciate all the extra effort and initiatives that you put into that. And uh, yeah, I just want to close. There's contact information for me and the mission statement of Jane, leave this world better than you found it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Great presentation today. I noticed one our uh, uh, people in the chat said, you know, thanks for helping us gaze into the future of irrigation today. And that's really what it was, but it was uh, it was even more of a gaze because a lot of these products are available today. And uh, I think you uh, presented it in a really understandable way. So uh, thanks very much for helping us with that. Uh, I also want to say that um, a couple of weeks ago, you know, we uh, had Michael Derwinko talking about uh, photography and in landscape and agriculture. And uh, we did say we'd announce the award winner today I was talking to Mike earlier today about 10 30 says it's still really close for two people and I said well you know we can we can give two prizes so uh first place in our photography award was Jasmine Grubb and she wins the Hero 3 Gro Go GoPro and then also uh, Marilyn Johnson is going to win a smooth gimbal for uh, for her entry as well so I want to thank everybody for their entries uh, I want to let you know that we're going to be posting those on the website very shortly. So we'll give you a heads up on that, but you can always check uh, our blog, the Jane blog for those uh, entries and those photos. And you'll see quite a few of them in the uh, Smart Irrigation Month uh, uh, activities that are going on in digital media uh, all month, uh, uh, supported by uh, the Irrigation Association. Again, Eric, fabulous job. I really appreciate it. And thanks to everybody who checked in today. We, uh, we really appreciate your time and your interest in this. Uh, so thanks everybody and we'll see you next week. Thank you.